Welcome to the BFF Report. This is episode number 50. Five zero. Isn't that crazy, guys? I've been doing this for so long now. And I moved, right? Can you tell? I got this whole new spot now. I made sure to set it up exactly the way it was at the other place because I know you guys freak out with change and everything. So I put the pipes back, right? I put the sign back. Everything's cool. My lower third. Got my name on it. It's still the same, so don't worry. Don't worry. Don't trip. Everything's going to be just fine. And now, today, we're focusing on the top five most controversial games of 2010. Coming in at number five on our list is Global Agenda. And while they didn't have any full-on cataclysmic failures, they sure as hell had a few close calls and otherwise questionable moments this past year. When the game launched, it proudly touted its No L's tagline, a welcome gesture to gamers who tire of the endless supply of fantasy games from the MMO machine. It worked out great for hype, and then they launched. Global Agenda received some seriously mixed reviews. An MMO FPS that's instance-based with no PvE elements, and that's it? Where were the awesome vehicles that I was promised? Where are these huge battles for territorial control? They had Conquest to fill that void, but with the upcoming subscription fee hanging over our heads in order to even play it, what was the point even participating at all? Several months later, still no monthly fee, still no PvE content, hi res drops the two-part Sandstorm patch. It brought a ton of changes to some of the game's core mechanics and made it more in line with your typical MMO, with weapon upgrades and all that good stuff. It also finally lets you step out of the dome and into the questing world, with your first stop being the oh-so-cleverly named Junk Town. Sandstorm, in my opinion, pretty much saved Global Agenda, but had they been able to work that in at launch, they would have probably kept more of their launch day player base and therefore would more than likely be in a better place right now. Outside of that, there was some news of, that kind of slid under the radar. Apparently, there's some beef between Hi-Rez founder E-Rez Goren and GameBreaker.TV's Gary Gannon. Something about yachts or something, I don't know. Coming in at number four on our list is Alods Online, which is by far our favorite game from G Potato. And unfortunately, it's like nobody's favorite now, and I'll tell you why. The game started off with the fear of death res sickness that lasted up to an hour. It reduced stats by 25%, but it stacked. So if you died once, 25% minus stats you, okay? Died again, minus 50 stats you. That's right, you were totally screwed. You were just asked out of 50% of your stats unless you went and bought this buff from the store that cost uh, roughly $1.35 an hour if you were to break it down that way. So they were like, wow, okay, you know what, maybe that is a little bit of harsh. It does get pretty expensive for people that go and raid. So they replaced it with another debuff that only affected single items on your person. But it still required the cash shop to remove this buff unless you grinded your ass off in order to get myrrh or gold or whatever kind of in-game currency it was in order to stop it. Now, if you raided again, if you raided, this cost you just a ridiculous amount of money. Guess what? People weren't having that shit. They were completely done with the whole... I'm being penalized for dying in your game, Alods. Thanks a lot. I'm out. Peace. And that's pretty much the way it went. A lot of people bailed on this game. Alods effectively killed itself with one single patch. Sitting at number three in our list is not even a single game. It's actually a single game developer. Cryptic. Whoo, man, can these guys just not get a break? What is going on over there? They kicked things off with Champions Online, which was doing, eh, it was doing all right. It was an okay game, it was fun. I got to make Gizmo Duck, who's awesome. What's up, Gizmo Duck? But for whatever reason, the game didn't really take off the way they wanted it to, and uh, whatever, we move on. We have other games to develop, like, for example, Star Trek Online. Now, this game came out, and they launched it so fast. Now, I don't know how long they were working on it beforehand, but man, when this game launched, it was just chock full with weirdness. I'm in a ship inside of a ship. How does that make any sense? Back on the Champions Online side, Bill Roper was like, boom, I'm out. And he left, and that was it. Now, it's never a good sign when somebody who's a pivotal part of the company leaves, right? It's definitely not a good sign when two people leave. Not even, maybe a few months later, Craig Zinkovich, executive producer, left to do things like play with his kids in the summertime and walk his goat and farm bees. What? This is like that time that dude was like, screw y'all, I'm going to space, bitches, with the Russians. Not long after that, Cryptic announced that they're going to make Champions Online free to play in 2011. Oh, by the way, on top of that, we're also going to bring back lifetime subs. So spend your $300 with us and you can play this free to play game. What's going on here? I'm getting mixed signals. And then they follow that up with, hey, we want to make STO free to play. 
But in order to convince us to do that, we need you guys to go and play Champions Online to prove to us that you're willing to play Star Trek Online, the space game about Star Trek, and you gotta play those superhero game to prove it to us. I don't understand, guys. It doesn't make any sense. Please stop f***ing with my feelings, Cryptic. It hurts. And coming in number two on our list, All Points Bulletin. If someone told you they were going to make an MMO version of Grand Theft Auto, you would say hella motherfucking yes, right? Well, Real Time World said the same thing, but they got a hundred million dollars to make it happen. APB was conceptualized as far back as 2005, and David Jones at one point said that it would be available in 2008 for both the PC and the 360. That never happened. This did, however, give RTW lots of time to develop a music sequencer, a symbol creator, vehicle customization system, and one of the most complex character creation systems we've ever seen in any game ever. Finally, two years later, APB goes to open beta for a grand total of one week. The beta testers were all over the forum citing issues with soggy driving mechanics, repetitive gameplay, and aimbots. RTW does nothing to fix these issues and instead released an NDA against the reviewing community that prevented them from releasing any reviews until a week after the game launches. RockPaperShotgun.com actually put it best when they said, Whatever the reason is, they've crossed a very obvious and very ridiculous line. The fixes were rolling out, but none of them addressed the major issues that we had with core game mechanics. And up until launch, many of us felt that APB, you know, had something going for it despite all that. But herein lies the problem. How can we call this an MMO? It was like a first person shooter in a very large instance with random occurrences of PvP. There wasn't enough MMO in there to really give you a sense of progression and accomplishment. Hey, I just stopped some guy from robbing that store. Oh look, another guy is robbing another store. Maybe I guess I should go stop him too, yeah. The only MMO thing about it was the subscription model, which was a strange hybrid of free to play and subscription based. Their in-game currency, which you could earn by selling items on their auction house, could net you enough points to buy a subscription. Those points could also be purchased with real life money. So besides the fact that any weapon, vehicle, or upgrade can be purchased with cold hard cash money, the person that sells the item can turn around and use those points to purchase in-game time. There are players who had earned so many points within the first week, they didn't have to pay a monthly fee for the first year. This also screwed up the in-game economy because people would sell items for RTW points instead of regular in-game currency earned through completing missions. So, this left the average player to have to grind out rep with whatever contact they had to earn money to buy better weapons by fighting players who were equipped with superior gear courtesy of their wallets and not their time. Finally, 79 days after launch, the servers closed. RTW went into bankruptcy and all the developers and engineers who had relocated for the sole purpose of working for them were completely asked out. All Points Bulletin is the number one shortest lived MMO in the history of gaming. But then in November, K2 Networks, parent company of Gamers First, comes along and purchases APB for $2.3 million. And they promise to release the game in 2011 under its new name, APB Reloaded. Final Fantasy XIV was to be the greatest epic fantasy MMO ever. After all, it's freaking Final Fantasy, right? Everyone was down until we got to ask questions. With current MMOs that are out right now, uh, like let's take uh, a lot's online, a free-to-play MMO that was released recently, uh, they did not put a mini-map in, and they also did not have an auto-attack. Then there's Ion, which does not have swimming. In Final Fantasy 11 and now 14, uh, there's no jump. What was the reasons behind not including something that people would, would uh, your, your average MMO gamer would consider to be a basic function? The, the main reason is because we can't, we don't think it's this, it's important to have the functions in the game. They don't need to have the functions in the game. So that's the main reason. So even if you jump around, nothing is going to happen, so that's the <laughs> right Alright. So let's analyze this for a second. Tanaka didn't explain why he chose to admit what is arguably a standard gameplay mechanic in today's games. He laughed and said it was simply not needed. What does this say about his knowledge of what should be his target demographic? The no jump attitude carried over into everything they did. They didn't communicate with the players directly and instead relied on fan sites to translate their patch notes and publications, resulting in needless speculation and lots and lots of frustration. Then, regarding the terribly documented fatigue system, Tanaka himself tweets about how we foreigners 
throw together words and fabricate remarks about it, sending the way wrong message to everyone paying attention to this game. Then along comes some jerk off with an attitude problem who gets his hands on an XIV beta key. Yeah, me. Final Fantasy XIV was by far the easiest game to poke fun of because it handed out shortcomings by the truckloads. It had its ups though, it was shiny and had cool cutscenes every 10 levels. I was out there running around having a good time, checking out the scenery, and I, I noticed that I've seen this before. And as a matter of fact, I just saw that two seconds ago. Well, that's kind of weird, I decided to keep going. Fans of the franchise went absolutely nuts over this. They kept citing other games for doing the same thing, but they completely missed the point. XIV championed itself on its depth and immersion, yet failed to give me a 200 yard stretch of road that wasn't identical to the next 200 yards. The video got so popular that it even made it into this interview with Tanaka conducted by PC Gamer. And those guys don't look very happy. The game went to open beta on September 2nd and the feedback came in like a tidal wave of sweat from the palms of frustrated gamers. The UI was horribly laggy, there was no auction house, and where the fuck was my chocobo? Square Enix did nothing to communicate to the fans that they were reviewing the feedback. Three weeks later, Final Fantasy launches for the players who pre-ordered and the reviewers went nuts. The game has potential, it needs polish, we can't recommend that you spend $50 and then $12.99 a month. XIV made its mark as one of the most polarizing games in recent history. By comparison, it actually scored lower than All Points Bulletin, the game that, you know, lasted 79 days. To this day, they have yet to charge a monthly fee, and since launch, a lot has happened at Square Enix. Tanaka voluntarily steps down and several key players in the development team are replaced. Not more than a month after claiming the PS3 version was completed, they backpedaled and instead pushed the release date back indefinitely. Oh, and they will not be charging a monthly subscription until further notice. And on top of all that, Square Enix was forced to slash their net profit forecast from 142.9 million to 11.9 million for the 2010 fiscal year, citing, of course, a lack of performance in their Final Fantasy IP. All of this has earned it a pretty solid hold on the number one position in our top five most controversial games of 2010. Big shockers, right? Like Final Fantasy XIV, who thought that'd be number one? It's crazy. Anyways, let's think back to 2009. When Final Fantasy XIV was announced, people were like, holy crap, this game's gonna be amazing. We kind of assumed that it would be, again, until we started asking questions, and then things started happening, and then, you know, uh, you guys saw the video. And then there was All Points Bulletin. Again, Grand Theft Auto, the MMO. Oh, we thought it was gonna be amazing, and then look what happened. So now, let's look at 2011. We have Guild Wars 2. We're gonna assume it's gonna be amazing, right? Of course, we're going to assume it's gonna be amazing. We have DC Universe Online, which you'll probably see me check out like next week or so. Um, big, big IP. Assume it's gonna be amazing, right? We have Star Wars The Old Republic. Again, big IP. Assume it's gonna be amazing. We probably thought that Star Trek Online was gonna be amazing. Now, of course, everyone's gonna say, oh, psh, I already knew that it was gonna be bad from the second I heard who was making it or whatever BS excuse you guys wanna make. No, trust me, the general public was like, this might work. And look at Tor, this might work. So next week, this time around, who knows? Maybe the top five will include one of your favorite games that you're looking forward to right now. Sorry, it's just the way things work. Hit me up, AK Mike B. Next week, DCUO, Rift, maybe one of those two. I don't know, episode 51 in the new year, 2011. Is that crazy? <sighs> That's it, guys. I got a new light here. I love it. I almost tripped on my box. See, I'm not done unpacking yet. So, you know, I'm going to walk out this way.